I'll start off by thanking Alex Hinchelwood, who's our root drainage engineer, for his good work and his support in not only putting this presentation together, but, but for uh, putting many of the slides with it today. So, Wales, like the rest of Western Britain, is wet, and so drainage of the infrastructure is important. And practical experience as a PY engineer, um, and latterly as the root asset manager track, has demonstrated over and again how important this is. And this paper, A Root Asset Manager's Perspective, looks at some of the issues and how the team in Wales have been tackling them since the route came into being in November 2011. So I've identified 10 key points, and I should explore each of these illustrating how our policy has developed over time. And in the early days, deciding to, where to spend the money um, wasn't really a problem. We had quite a number of locations, like the one in the picture there. Um, things like um, really obvious problems, repeated track flooding, ponding of water, water running where it shouldn't, etc. Um, but uh, I hope this paper proves of interest. This site, incidentally, at Gerwin, um, and perhaps highlights some of the questions last last time, but what do you do about outside the railway boundary? And again, this was a typical problem, um, and the issue was solved by gaining the landowner's agreement and reinstating the drains, which went across a field to an outfall into a stream. So point one, treat drainage as a system. It is a system, it has an inlet and an outlet, and it must offer continuity of flow. If a river system flows into an area without an appreciable flow or outlet, the area is called a swamp, and it's no different than <laughs> railway drainage terms. Water does not understand the nuances of who owns the drain, be it civils, structures, buildings or track. Drainage must be managed as a system, which is what is done on Wales Route. We have a drainage engineer who acts for the various functions to oversee the renewal, refurbishment and maintenance of the route's drainage assets. And this has proved very effective in prioritising work and making sure that a holistic view is taken. A key element of this has been the pooling of the various drainage funding pots, um, allowing a flexible approach to be taken to delivery. As an example, the track drainage and the cutting will often be improved by provision or refurbishment of a crest drain that intercepts the water before it gets anywhere near the track. Another key issue for drainage is that the capacity must be compatible with it throughout. Our works have discovered many locations where insufficient capacity has been provided due to undersized pipes, bodged repairs perhaps, or changes in gradient leading to slowing of the flow, ponding and silting. And also, despite decades of trying, the railway has never perfected the anti-gravity drain. <laughs> when we started, we had no drainage register or up-to-date plans, so we started with the quick wind. For example, track flooding sites, flooding of adjacent land, and places where drainage was obviously a problem, like wet bed sites and locations with water ponding. The works depicted are a site of a washout at Clamby Hangel near Abergavenny and show the before and after views. I hasten to add the bottom one is the before. Um, um, so whilst we were there, um, we've now, this was a site where water was coming down over the cutting crest, over the crest of the, um, into the cutting. So we've installed a cess drain now to drain the track and we've made sure that where we built the counterforts into the bank, these pick up on the drain to carry the water away. Drainage records are vital. After all, many parts of our drainage systems are by definition buried and not readily visible. When a drain is full um, or dry, um, how can you tell which way it flows? Um, and how do you know where the outfall is when it is hidden? For example, um, tumbling into a culvert below the track or actually connected to an outside party sewer system. It is a crime, in my opinion, that the good records that once existed have been lost um, in the years since privatisation, but um, that's life. On Wales Route, we are nearly finished with the task of mapping our drainage systems using a digital system developed as part of Network Rail's My Work app. This allows the inspector, and we see somebody using it, it just works on an ordinary iPad. Um, this allows the inspector to collect information on new drainage assets, including their GPS coordinates, which are important, and update existing records with the current condition of the asset. It's a very straightforward system to use, and the guy there is just a trackman from one of our depots. 
doing that. We can then, because it's digital, we can then upload into Network Rail's asset database, which is the ellipse system that we use, for those who don't uh, know. Um, and it allows both one-off activity and cyclic work, such as inspection and cleaning, to be planned. And the coordinates allow the data to be mapped, and we see part of the mapping um, of a bit of the South Wales main line at the bottom. Um, so we can map the drainage assets to making sure that they don't get lost. If, should they become covered in ballast, you can still find, using the coordinates, the catch bits and things like that. Don't rip it, rip it up, refurbish it. There's been a tendency for block drainage systems to be ripped up and replaced, but our experience shows that many track drainage systems that may appear beyond redemption can be refurbished rather than replaced. This not only saves money, which is always a scarce resource, um, but um, it's also quicker to plan um, and execute, and also um, you have some drainage while this work's actually going on rather than ripping it out completely. Um, for example, one section of a pipe or catch pit collapsed, the system upstream will silt up, but jetting followed by probing <coughs> or with rods or camera servos shows that renewal of the failed elements alone will allow the fish system to function again properly. Also, many systems were built with good quality brick or concrete catch pits, so why destroy these if they're perfectly serviceable? This is a win in that the functioning, a functioning drain is better than no drain at all, and it allows the functionality of the system to be properly assessed and evaluated over time, and a more objective view develops of its long-term needs. From the site at the top, there's just um, where we've been uh, cleared out a ditch and proved the ditch that runs into a siphon system under the track. And perhaps this will answer the question raised about do you look outside the railway boundary? I think it's absolutely vital. And you can't manage the drainage system by just focusing on what lies within the railway boundary. As riparian landowners, we have a duty to maintain the flow of water across our land and along our watercourses um, for the benefit of our neighbours as well as ourselves. And some of these drains may not be evident at all from the railway, and their original purpose may have been forgotten. Whilst carrying out drainage renewal at Lambie Hangle recently, we discovered that the foul drainage from a former railway house was still connected, as it has been since the railway company deigned to provide a flushing toilet, to the track drainage system. During the construction of the railway, many watercourses were rerouted through culverts and siphons, over aqueducts and along our land. And do you know where all the drainage is that's sitting at the top of cuttings, for example? Failure to maintain these channels may cause flooding of our infrastructure, but it may cause flooding or damage um, to our neighbours and loss and reputational damage to us. Sim similarly, failure by others to maintain the channels downstream may cause issues like silting of culverts, blocking of drainage outfalls or overtopping of ditches, and we need to be conscious of this. Experience shows that it may be beneficial to tackle these issues ourselves with the agreement of the landowner. It's also necessary to keep a weather eye on our neighbours' activities that may change the drainage patterns and water flow from ploughing up of arable land, which can have a surprising effect, um, to the construction of new housing and highways. Railway cuttings seem to be a tempting place to dispose of unwanted, unwanted rainwater. The top picture is above Bangor Tunnel, and it's not obvious there's a railway anywhere near there at all. Um, when we had issues with water running down past the tunnel portal, and a prob the problem was traced back to the failure of a ditch in a field on top of the tunnel that was no longer on railway land. Um, so how did we tackle it? Well, we gained access rights, um, so we purchased some of the land back, and we built a new drainage system, which you see there, um, which now removes the water in a controlled way um, into a water course. The field is no longer boggy, so the landowner is actually quite pleased about it as well, and he grazes his sheep on that site to make sure it doesn't become overgrown in the future. The bottom picture is at Mostyn on the North Wales coast, and perhaps is typical of some of the uh, problems we have. The water comes off the main road, which is behind the wall on the left, and ponds in the down cess. Um, from where it has to make its way through the track to get to the sea, which is behind the wall on the other side. 
and we're currently installing a drainage system as part of Trackworks that will intercept this water at source and then take it straight to the sea. Design, it's not all pipes and catch bits. And I think we need to stand back sometimes and sort of think about what are we trying to do with the drainage system. So when looking at carrying out track renewal and refurbishment, always consider drainage as part of the remit, particularly when the works are likely to have drainage implications, such as lowering to improve clearances at overbridges or for electrification, and we're doing a lot of that at the moment. I always insist on seeing the bottom of the cut and the drainage levels on the long section and cross section drawings and the details of the track set when a track renewal is to take place um, to make sure. But sadly on Wales Route we have a number of sites um, that only a few years ago were old formation failure due to gauge, well we have formation failure due to gauge clearance works with poor track bed specification and no drainage. Um, and this is the site at Charleston, it's a gauge enhancement site, completed at the end of CP4, so that's the end of 13-14 financial year. Um, and as you can see, it's already got wet beds in it. Um, an investigation reveals that the drain installed in the six foot, uh, you can see there's a drain in the uh, six foot there, um, but it's far too shallow um, and it hasn't actually drained the track properly. So when planning and designing new track drainage, always look at all the options, including where's the water coming from, whether a drainage system is necessary at all. Is a pipe system best, or will a ditch or a channel system work best? Channels and ditches are actually quite easy to maintain um, compared to pipes. Is there a suitable outfall? And that's often the biggest challenge, is finding a suitable <coughs> outfall. And if connecting to an existing system, does that have the capacity and is it in good order? Designed for the right capacity, uh, material costs as part of a cost of installing a new drainage system are actually quite small part of the cost. So putting in a larger pipe really is not a major increase in the cost. The big costs are about mobilising to site and the actual construction. So it's a false economy not to put in the right size pipes that you want. On the same basis, new drainage should be designed for low maintenance and this includes the use of good quality materials um, and robust design for things like catch bits and head walls. It also includes designing for flows that will render the system self-cleaning if at all possible and for good access to any locations where silting may occur. For example, avoid buried junctions and sharp turns where the flow will be impeded, impeded and avoid grills that will require regular cleaning to avoid blockage. I've also found that many proprietary catch bit systems have proved unsatisfactory in service. And I personally think that concrete or GRP catch bit rings are still the best solution. Don't forget the oddball part. Don't forget that drainage systems require more than simple pipes and ditches and include features such as aqueducts, siphons, trash grills, flumes, oil interceptors and flat valves. In some places, pumping may even be necessary with the support of the plant engineer. But all of the above require bespoke arrangements to keep them operating as intended. And simply failing to keep a trash screen clean, for example, can render an other otherwise perfectly serviceable system useless and lead to localised flooding. And, and I'm sure we can all think of places in urban areas where dumping of rubbish is a continuous problem. And, Again, throwing it over the railway fence seems to be quite popular. Failure to main oil, in oil interceptors may lead to environmental and reputational damage if oil is discharged into a water course. And these are not always obvious who's responsible for these arrangements. In today's railway, they are often associated with train maintenance and refuelling points, which are in turn often leased to train operating and freight operating companies. But are the maintenance requirements clearly understood and allocated to the key parties involved? And even within network rail, ownership is not necessarily clear, as drainage from buildings, including foul waste, is the responsibility of the buildings ram rather than the civil ram or the track ram. We recently had issues with a new depot facilities in Mahuncliffe, where a drainage system for a new building was connected to the existing system. Um, resulting in sewage being discharged into a river, um, something that cost a lot to sort out after the event. An interesting case is pictured here, um, where the fa was the failure to maintain a tidal 
flat valve. Um, and that lady's field is actually filled with seawater, um, which isn't particularly good for it. Um, and this is a classic case. The railway here is built on a low embankment along the foreshore. I don't know what it was about Stevenson and Brunel, but they like building railways along the foreshore. Um, but, uh, so it wasn't really causing us any problems at all, but failure to maintain that uh, non-return valve actually caused silting up of the drainage, and so it didn't work at all in the end, and led to flooding. Another important issue is who delivers your drainage works. Um, one of the problems we've had, of course, is that we've lost experience of people in actually delivering drainage well in the railway environment. Um, but our experience has showed that you can get the right job for the right money by using the right people with the necessary skills and experience. For example, on Wales route, we use the track and off-track maintenance teams um, because they're good at doing things like cleaning pipe and ditch systems and general maintenance like de-vegging and clearing rubbish. Um, <coughs> and it's pretty cheap work as well. I mean, £15,000 will buy you three weeks with a mini digger and a couple of men clearing ditches. Um, the work, work, sorry, teething. The route works delivery teams have, we found are very good at installing new drains and refurbishment of existing systems where sections of pipe runs need to be replaced and things like that. And they're also good at organising things like getting into planting for jetting, camera surveys and things like that. But where the civils element is larger, such as rebuilding or repairing head walls, um, uh, repairing culverts, building masonry channels and flumes, then we use the civil miners' work and works contractor because, again, they can mobilise quickly the necessary skilled labour and equipment to do the job. Experience has also shown that the benefits of actually sticking with teams with a proven record, as this allows them to grow their capability and the continuity of work makes sure that the capability is retained. And as we all know, practice makes perfect. Another issue which comes up, and this will inevitably provoke some discussion, but pipes with slots or holes must be laid with the slots or holes downward to get the most benefit. Um, and again, there is evidence that slotted pipes probably work best um, and the newer pipes were being provided now with holes punched in are not anywhere near as satisfactory. The pictures show some, some good work that's been done on the route again. The top one is at Roman Bridge, which is a joint earthworks and track drainage project. Um, we see the part here where it's mainly track drainage, but further up it drains the earthworks, um, the cutting slopes. Um, and the bottom one is a, uh, a new system installed at Florina Pier um, near Merthyr, on the Cardiff to Merthyr line, where previously a ditch um, was the wrong side of the dead formation and was not draining the track properly. We've now got a proper uh, piped drainage system put in. This is perhaps the most obvious thing. Um, maintain the drainage you've got. Clearly it is folly not to maintain what you already have and this has been a weakness in recent years where good systems have been installed but then simply not maintained and followed up. And this has been particularly the case with the off-track drainage systems leading to expensive earthworks problems and we've seen some examples, some graphic examples today of where water in the wrong place could lead to some catastrophic failures. Um, and unnecessary track problems as water is not being managed when it enters the railway boundary. Network Rail has rightly been criticised by RABE for its earthworks maintenance strategy and drainage is a key part of this. Um, which is of course back to our approach on Wales route of, of managing it as a single entity. The works are often straightforward and things like cleaning out crest drains and restoring flumes and outfalls but the results in terms of risk reduction of cutting slope failure can be significant. From a track perspective, a benefit is that water captured and led away before it reaches the track, avoiding issues and in places, sorry, avoiding issues, and in places what making what first appeared to be an undersized drainage system actually perfectly fit for purpose. <clears throat> Maintaining track drainage um, is not all about cleaning pipes and involves things like removal of vegetation and rubbish from ditches. And it's important that these tasks are planned and done 
as they are not often the top of the section manager's list of priorities. And as a RAM, it's part of my role to make sure this activity is planned and resourced properly, as this is key to getting the whole life cost benefits from the assets. Um, and going back to record keeping, to help us, obviously, once you've got good records of where your drains are and what state they're in, it allows you to develop um, and schedule cyclical tasks um, using the ellipse work planning system. Um, and in turn, it allows you to pr predict um, based on experience, because you know what you've done and how successful you've been, um, future works. And hence, we can have a workload demand and resource demand planning for the future, which makes a big difference to um, when we, we'll be, we're starting now looking at the next control period, the next five years, and being able to actually put some numbers to um, the resources we require is a huge benefit of where we were five years ago. And the bottom line is that the track damage to track formation, earthworks and structures, uh, and loss through flooding and train disruption, is all money that is wasted, which could have been spent on the infrastructure. And the picture shows a good example of a project in uh, Lisfain in North Wales. A drainage scheme here primarily intended um, to improve the factor of safety of the earthwork, um, but it will have significant benefits to the track by controlling the water flow off the mountainside. So a bit about natural drainage and percolation. And don't forget that in many parts of the country, natural drainage will serve the purposes of the track, um, draining the track. And there are many miles of track in Wales, for example, on the coastal marges, which are built on sands and gravels um, that readily drain. Similarly, track on embankments, if the ballast is free draining and the formation correctly graded, will naturally drain. The opposite, of course, is true. Um, if the track ballast is completely choked with fines, and particularly if they're of a cohesive nature, such as clays and silt, then the best designed and installed drainage system in the world will not work if you cannot get the water out of the track and away. So when planning track work where drainage is an issue, this must be taken into account and the excavation uh, made wide enough to um, deal with it. The uh, top picture shows Again, a piece of track which is just a very terminally choked with clay. And as you can see, the um, where attempts being made to tamp it to uh, hold the top. And all we've created is pockets in the clay now, which will just fill up with water once it rains. Um, the bottom one isn't on Wales route. Uh, it's actually on SNCF. Um, and shows the, the fact that you do find railways on sand occasionally. Um, tamping it might be another issue, mind, but there we are. Evidence of problems. I would suggest that we all have a role, whether you're a track engineer or an earthworks engineer or a buildings engineer, um, in avoiding drainage issues becoming drainage problems. Um, the evidence is often clear to see for those who take the trouble to look, be it repeated loss of track top and cyclic top, like the middle picture, um, and you get the early stages of that off the track recording traces, and we've seen many examples today where people are using track recording, track geometry recording in a proactive way to manage problems. Early stages of wet beds, um, watercress and washes growing in the cess and finally ponds and even ducks. Um, the one on the left is fairly obvious and shows some of the unusual problems that you can actually be, um, get. Um, this, this one here is, is a problem due to a lack of capacity in the stream on the approach to an aqueduct. When the stream is full, it overtops and reverts to the course it once had before we built the railway. Um, ironically, the water course actually just crosses the railway in the aqueduct from the one side to the other. It then runs parallel to the railway for a few hundred yards and crosses back underneath again. So the water that runs into the cutting then runs down the track and then gets away. Um, we're working on this one. But I think it's a fairly major job to, to rectify it. But that said, looking at the other pictures, cyclic top does not develop overnight. And again, it is often associated with poor ballast and underlying drainage problems. Likewise, track that is covered in lush vegetation is clearly not well drained. So I am um, at that point. I thank you for your attention. <laughs>